even in a day and age, we don't know what all is happening, balloons in the sky and everything else going on. We have no idea, but the Bible still stands and the Bible is truth. Come what may, we have a book that tells us how to live and what to look for. And if I were you, I'd just be looking for his return very soon. And we'll see when that day is, hopefully today. It'd be good to be in heaven today, wouldn't it? No more pain, no more problems. Anyway, not before my preaching, though. Let's get through that. You got to suffer through one more today. Take your hymnals. Go to hymn 362. Hymn 362. Let's sing about the fact that there's power in the blood of Jesus. 362. Brother Brian, would you lead us? There's power in the blood. Let's all stand. Anyway, let's go ahead and sing all four verses this morning. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Sometimes you ask yourself, why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Was there any other way you and I could have been redeemed and on our way to heaven? The answer is no. The blood of Christ is what was demanded as a sacrifice for our sins. And that's why one must be born again and Jesus' righteousness, his blood is applied to our account. And that's what we praise God for, isn't it? We praise him for his love and his mercy. Let's open with a word of prayer this morning and we'll begin the service today. Brother Charlie, would you pray for us today? Amen. You may be seated. Choir, you may head down. Thank you so much. I hope you've had a, a great day today. I've got several things to announce. We'll do announcements here in just a little bit. But uh, just a couple things. Uh, we are finishing up our directory. Um, we are missing about six or seven uh, families, uh, pictures uh, that we're going to put in the directory. So if you would like to and you have not done it yet, um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure we take time for that. And then we'll get that directory out. And that way we'll know who's who. And uh, you can quit asking yourself, um, who is that? Who is that? I've seen them before, but I don't remember their name. You can just carry around the directory and flip through it and know who's who. Uh, so we'll finish that up today. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our chorus. Miss Barbara, if you'd come up here. We've been learning this song, You Are My All in All. 
And uh, we've been working on this one, and we're going to sing this together. Um, it's, you are my strength when I am weak. How many of you ever get weak? Not only physically, but emotionally, spiritually. Jesus is there for us. Aren't you glad for that? Let's sing this together. As you're learning it, we'll sing it out to the Lord. Would you give us an intro? Here we go. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, you give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Good. Now, why is he worthy on this next verse? Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I'll bless your name. You are my good, good. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. Wonderful. Thank you, Miss Barbara. I wonder in heaven, as churches all around the world, all around the country, all over everywhere are singing to God, whether this morning or last night or whenever it was, and yet he hears all of our worship and he knows all of our hearts at the same time. That's why he's worthy. Amen. We're going to sing this next song and then we'll shake hands and greet one another. After this next chorus, the young people be dismissed to junior church. And uh, if you young people just want to follow the group of children that will walk out and uh, we'll do this. This next one is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And we have music for this one. Gentlemen, we got this one up there. They're sleeping. There we go. That's it. You got to smile, though. Dismissed to your class.
make our way back to our seats, we'll go ahead and sing this chorus one more time. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You may be seated. All right. I made a mistake this morning. We are supposed to have celebrate our birthdays for the month of February. Um, I didn't. So remind me next week. Where's Kevin? Remind me next week. Um, we'll, we'll celebrate everyone's birthday for February next week. So a lot of things to, um, that are coming up. Um, number one, the ladies have ladies fellowships um, here at the church and ladies meetings ever so often. And they do what they call a secret prayer sister. And what they do is draw names uh, with, the, with the ladies that are at the meetings. And what they do is they, every month, you pledge to give something secretly to the sister that you draw. And um, you pray for them. And uh, you leave a gift out on the table and uh, for them just to encourage them. And I don't know how many, where's Miss Barbara? How, about how many people do you think we will be a part of that? Yes. It's not every month? Okay. That's when you give them a gift. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just up here. All right. Miss Barbara has all the information. If you would like to be a part of that, after the service this morning, don't run out. If you're a lady who wants to be a part of that, they're going to draw names. As the Bible says, cast lots. <laughs> no, no, they're going to draw names. Just come up here on this side, Miss Barbara. Ladies, if you want to be a part of that, just come up here. Miss Barbara will have that information. It should only take a few minutes. We don't want to keep you from Bob Evans or anything this afternoon. So we'll make that quick. Uh, but ladies, if you want to be a part of that, um, it's nice to have someone praying for you all the time, and that's what this is about. So also, a couple's dinner we're going to have on February 23rd. It will be in Pendleton. And uh, folks, if you would like to go to that, and there's a sign-up sheet on the back, remember, um, it is going to be a costly restaurant. I tried to get the menu uh, in, in time so I could show it to you, but I would plan on somewhere between $35 and $45 a person. And uh, you can go higher, lower, whatever you want. Um, just so you know, the church is not paying for everyone, okay? You pay for yourself at that dinner, and uh, you get a ride, and we'd love to have you. We'll be in Pendleton. We'll have a slide for that. Oh, you got one up here. Babysitting is available, and we'll have that at 6.30 on February 23rd in Pendleton. Uh, Brother Charlie, what's the name of it? it? Starts with a C, but I forgot it. Costellos? Catellos? It's Catellos, that's right. I don't know, I'm just, I just work here. Catellos there in Pendleton, couples, if you want to come, make sure you sign up. We have to have a number for them. Um, we're also having a deacon's meeting February 15th. Our marriage conference is this coming week. Some of you couples are signed up to go. Um, the, the schedule is, uh, will be up there at 12. Make sure you're there. I know uh, those who are going, I'll talk with you personally. Um, we have a business meeting on February 19th after the evening service. Ushers, go ahead and come forward. The month of March is going to be our missions month, and we're going to live stream one of our missionaries on um, March uh, 5th, and then we'll have different missionaries in throughout the month, and we'll have uh, our missions conference and everything coming up as well on the 18th and 19th. I'll have more information about that as we, as we continue here. Okay, um, we're also starting a food pantry in our church. Um, this is not a, how should I say it? This is just if somebody wants to come to a service and get a few things to take home. We're not going to stock people's refrigerators. We're not able to do that. But on the 12th, 19th, and 26th, every Sunday through February, we're going to have totes at each door. And there's a list of things that we have asked you to bring um, just to put back there. Um, there's several things. Um, I think the lists are on the back table. 
Um, one of the ushers confirm that for me after, after we're done here. But if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, you can start bringing things for that. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll take up the offering. And uh, uh, we'll make you be faithful to give back to God a portion of what he's given to you. Brother Dallas, would you pray? Father, we're so blessed to be able to be here today. We're blessed, Lord, to have this church that does get the truth. And Father, as we give today, may we go forth, be a light, use this offering to spread the gospel here in this community and abroad. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Next, turn with me, if you will, to page 504. 504, let's see, count your blessings. Let's stand one last time this morning. I think we'll sing the first, the second, and last verse. First, second, and last, 504. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, catch your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your All right, if you would remain standing, um, take a Bible, whether you brought one with you or you've got one in the pew in front of you, feel free to grab that. If you don't have a Bible at all, take that home with you. We'd love for you to have that as our gift to you. Go to the book of John, the book of John chapter 16, John chapter 16. John 16, we're going to read just a few verses today. And we're going to talk about uh, this thought today from the book of John. Jesus equips us for what he wants us to do. Jesus equips us for what he wants us to do. Um, everyone in here, if you're a child of God, you've been born again, you belong to him, you are one of his family, um, you are equipped to do what God would have you to do. Now, we get a choice. We can serve him or we can choose not to serve him. Each one in here gets a choice. You have that freedom of will. But I want you to see today, we have a lot of defeat. 
We have a, I can never do better, I can never change this, and I want to tell you, you can today through Jesus. John chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. I'll read verses 1 through 3, then we'll all read verse 4 together this morning. John 16, starting in verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. Let's read verse 4 together. Here we go. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because good, good. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll begin this morning. Brother Houston, would you pray for us today? Amen. You may be sweet, be sweeted, be seated. Uh, the ladies are going to sing a special for us. That's a good question to ask. Is there anything too hard for God? I think, I hope you would say no. There's nothing too hard for God. Because there's not. And uh, I, we're gonna talk, I guess we'll talk a little bit about that today as we, we get into the message in John chapter 16. So in this passage of scripture, from chapter 13 through chapter 17, we see Jesus is going to share some very important information, not only to his 
11 disciples, because Judas is about to leave uh, in, er, in chapter 13, Judas will go out and Judas has made his mind up to, to choose money over the Son of God. And uh, he made that decision. Um, and we see that throughout this, these few verses. And I want to just talk through quickly and then we'll get into, into the message today. Sometimes we go through life and we constantly beat ourselves up. I could never do that. I can't do this. This is how I was raised. This is who I am. This is what I've done. This is all I know. I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have this. I don't have access to that. And we have all these reasons why we cannot serve God or why God would not want us to serve him. And I say to that hogwash, we have what is necessary to serve him. And I want to point that out today. Now, whether we choose to allow him to work through us, that's a whole different ballgame. But you have what is necessary to serve him if you are one of his children. And I see some visitors around the room. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope to have a chance to meet you after the service and uh, just get to know you a little more. Thank you for coming. John chapter 16, we see Jesus is talking to men who've been close to him for just a few years now. Jesus came to this earth and we see very little of Jesus' life the first 30 years. We, we can speculate and we can guess about some things, but we don't know everything that took place during that time. But after those 30 years, for three years, Jesus goes into ministry. And Jesus goes and calls several men who were unqualified. It's not like they went to school, most of them. Most of them were fishermen, and one was a tax collector. And, you know, it's not like these men were the high, uh, highfalutin, sharp people of the day. No, no, no. God knew that those people wouldn't serve him the way he wanted them to serve him. God chose fishermen for the most part. God chose your average person to follow him and eventually establish the local New Testament church. Now Jesus is talking to his close followers. And I want you to say, we can't look at all these scriptures from chapter 13 to chapter 17, but I want you to think about this today. We live today by God's love, by God's promises, by God's words, and by God's blessings. That's how we live today. Okay? We don't live through the, you know, with all the problems, with all the heartache. We live as victorious Christians by God's love, by God's promises, by God's plan or his words, and by God's blessings. And I will look at these here in just a moment. This is the night before his crucifixion. They have eaten together. They've had the Last Supper. He's washed their feet. He's taught them and teaching them how to pray. And then in chapter 17, we see what is called the great high priestly prayer of Jesus, the Son of God. One of the greatest prayers to ever be prayed because it's Jesus. Turn over to chapter 17. Look at verse 20 really quick. I want you to see something here. So all of these promises that Jesus has made to his followers, look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So friend, that is for you and I today. Don't worry about the screen, it's okay. That is for you and I today. These promises are for those who believe and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Go back to chapter 13. We're going to look at a few of these verses. Jump in. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. I want you to see Jesus' passion. Look at chapter 13. I want you to look at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, what hour is this? That he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. My friend, Jesus loves you. He cares about you. We live in the fact that Jesus loves me and cares for me. He not only cared for them, but he also cares for you today. That's how we live. Notice next, we, he made promises to them. Look at chapter 14, would you? Chapter 14, I know I'm skipping a lot. I'm just giving a brief overview, okay? There's so much here. You go home and read chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Change your life. But look at chapter 14. We live not only in his love, but we also live in his promises. Chapter 14, look at verse 3. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and what? Receive you unto myself. You say, Pastor, why can we be excited? Why as Christians can we be victorious? Because Jesus is coming back to get us, to take us to be with him for all of eternity. Amen? So we live in God's love. We live in the light of God's promises. But also we live according to his uh, plan. Live according to his plan. Go back to chapter 13. Look at verse 31. Remember, Peter says some things. Judas is kicked out. Peter says some things. But notice in verse 31, Therefore, when he was gone out, that's Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. The plan all along was that Jesus would come. He would die a horrendous death. He would rise a victorious resurrection, and he would ascend into heaven. God's plan being done brought glory to the Father. So what do we see? We live in light of God's love, God's promises, God's plan, and this is what we're going to spend time on in light of God's blessings. In light of God's blessings. At this time, just, just think with me just for a minute. These 11 men, were they bold at this point? What's going to happen in just a few hours? Jesus is going to go to a garden. Jesus is going to pray. And what were his disciples going to do? Fall asleep. Jesus is having a prayer meeting. They're having a sleeping meeting, right? After Jesus is taken, Judas comes, kisses him on the cheek. The, the soldiers grab him. It's dark out. They grab him. They take him back. Do all the disciples run after him? No, they run away bunch of cowards. Don't think too, too low of them, right? Because you and I would probably do the same thing, right? Man, we'd get a little nervous ourselves. They run away, they hide. So what is the difference? There's an author, John Phillips, he makes this statement. These men were powerless, ineffective, and afraid, but later on in the book of Acts, they became brave, convincing, and successful in the early church. What changed? What changed? We're going to see that today. Say, Pastor, how can I serve him? How can I live in light of a world where I don't trust anything about it? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Let's look at chapter 16, verse 1. So we know the setting. We know what's going on. We are told to live in light of God's love, God's promises, God's plans, and in light of God's blessings. That leaves very little room for all the other things we live, right? <laughs> all the other things that consume our mind, okay? I want you to write down this if you're taking notes today. We're going to start bringing this together. I want you to write down, Jesus is concerned about me. Jesus is concerned about me. Look at verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. So Jesus not only cared about his disciples in the moment, he cared not only about them, but later on anyone who would follow him. But he says this, I am going to warn you about something, so later on you are not offended. The word offended there is the idea of this, caught in a trap caught in a trap, or a surprise to the point you fall, or the idea of something bad is going to happen. So Jesus said, look, I'm concerned about you, I love you, I care about you, I'm going to go and die on a cross, and I know you don't understand it all, and I know your mind cannot comprehend the fact that I say I'm going and yet I'm coming back. You can't grasp all of that, but you understand this, I care about you. I care about what's going to happen to you. Friend, aren't you glad for this? As a follower of Jesus Christ, he cares about you. He cares about you. Now, does that mean bad things will not happen? No. Verse 2 and 3 are still here. Okay? The world and the world systems, they hate followers of Christ. They still do to this day. And we'll, we'll point that out here. But I want you to write down, Jesus is concerned about me. By the way, this morning, I'm talking more to those who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There was a time and place in their life where they recognized their sinful condition. They recognized that they had no hope in eternity. And they humbled themselves, accepted Jesus as their Savior, put their faith in Him. 
talking about his followers. If you're here today, maybe you don't know that. Maybe you're uncertain of where you would spend eternity. Jesus came to die for you, and he cares about your soul. I hope you'll think about that today. Jesus cares about me. He warns them, be careful that you'll not be offended, that you'll not get caught in a trap. In 1 Thessalonians in chapter 3, Paul wrote to the Thess church at Thessalonica, and he was worried that the tempter was going to get to them. I don't remember what verse, maybe verse 6. But he was worried that the tempter would get to them. Jesus says, hey, disciples, followers, I love you. I don't want you to fall. I don't want you to fall away from me. I don't want you to become so engulfed with these problems that you turn your back on me. I read this this week and I thought it was really good. Jesus to his child. I am in control. I am sovereign. I am able to make things happen the way I want them to go. Yes, I allow you to make your own choices. And I know you don't fully understand how these ideas can operate side by side. But I'm able to work within and around the choices you make to cause my ultimate purpose to succeed. For this, you must trust me. Ask me about your choices and plans. My wisdom is yours if you'll ask. So Jesus cares about me. And he cares about you. And he cares about what you're going through. And he loves you with a love that you cannot even understand. That is my Savior. That is Jesus. That's why his name and his name alone is worthy to be praised. Now, look at what he says to them. Look at verse 2. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever what? Okay, this is not comforting. Okay, you would have hoped that your leader, the Son of God, would have said, look, you have all power. No bad things are going to happen to you. No sickness, no pain, no sorrow. Nothing's going to happen because I have control and I'm just going to get you through life with no problems. That's not what Jesus said and that's not the life for the Christian today. I know there's preachers out there that say if you give enough money, if you do this, if you do that, if you have enough faith, nothing bad will happen to you. Friend, they're a liar. They're deceitful. Why? Jesus just told us what was going to come. Okay, notice he's talking to his closest followers here, but he said this. One day they'll put you out of the synagogue. One day they will even kill you. Just about every man in this room that Jesus is talking to lost his life. And the one that didn't, the only reason he didn't wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. He just, he made it through. One of them they dragged to death. One of them they beheaded. One of them they would, it said that they would skin them alive. They're, they went through all these tragedies. Jesus was warning them, don't fall away. What's this idea of put you out of the synagogue? Because in our day and age, in our culture, if we said, get out of this church, we don't want you here. If we were to say that for some reason, what would you do? Probably go to another one down the street, right? <laughs> There's a lot to choose from around here, right? Back then, the synagogue was the focal point of religion. If you got kicked out of there, it was like you wouldn't get a proper burial. You, your credibility would be ruined. It would be a bad thing. And Jesus says, one day you're going to go to the synagogues, they're going to kick you out. You're going to go and you're going to preach about me, they're going to kick you out. Look at verse 3, what he says, And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. Throughout history, Christians have been persecuted by the thousands and hundreds of thousands. Different times throughout the years, different People have persecuted uh, Christians today. It's more popular. Islam is, is destroying a lot of Christians' lives. And there's persecution going on all over. But Jesus is telling his followers, I care about you. I love you. There are going to be people who let you down. Anyone ever had somebody let you down before? Anyone in a church let you down? Anyone who you thought should have known better, they let you down a religious system, a church, somebody in the church, some leadership in a church, they let you down, don't they? Jesus is telling his followers, look, the religious system of the day, they'll not support you like they should. They'll not do these things. As a matter of fact, gentlemen, 
they're going to kill you. you. Say, Pastor, this isn't a good Sunday morning message. I thought you were going to tell us how he equips us. I will. I will. Let me get through this part. We'll get to the good stuff, okay? Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you. But notice here what happens in verse 4. Okay, so Jesus cares about you. Number two, I want you to see Jesus counsels you. Jesus counsels you. What does Jesus say? Verse four. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, what time? Persecution. When you're kicked out of the synagogues, when your life is on the line, when the bad things come to you, this is what I want you to do. Ye may, what? Remember that I told you of them. Take comfort in the fact that I'm with you. I know what you're going through. As a matter of fact, I told you that you would go through suffering and pain to follow me. Isn't that incredible? With Christ, he said, I'll go with you. I'll walk side by side with you. You just follow me. I'll go with you. Jesus counsels them to remember what he said. Listen up, church. Don't be shocked when things go wrong. Because they will, <laughs> or they have, or they are, <laughs> right? right? We're all in different levels of our life and different parts of our life. And some may be going through trials that you cannot even understand. Jesus says, listen, remember what I told you. Because when you get to that point, if you're not dwelling on what I said and you're not thinking about it, when you get to that point, you're going to be tempted to walk away. You're going to be tempted to leave what you've been told. Jesus said, you remember what I said. When you go through hard things, remember and hold true to God's word. Take your Bible, go to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Why is it important that you read his word and you study his promises and know what he has to say? Because you and I are going to go through hardship. Your, your life may not be threatened. I don't know what God has in store for us. I don't know what America is going to do. And several, I don't know. But when those hardships come, I want you to think about what Jesus had to say. Take your Bible, Psalms 119, and I want you to look at verse, um, oh, let's look at verse 162. Psalms 119 in verse 161, he's talking about people who persecuted him without a reason. But he says, my heart standeth in all of your word. Notice what he said in verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. In other words, there's, there's great comfort. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Why did he abhor lying? Because the law condemned it. Look at verse 164. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. But notice his conclusion here. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall what? What had Jesus just warned them against? Being offended. Being offended. Being caught off guard. Being caught in a trap. Having something happen to you that you were not expecting. Jesus counsels you, remember my word. Remember what I said. Friend, just practically speaking, if I could say this, you will face trials. I'll face trials. It's how you go through those trials that really matters, right? It's how you take the word of God during a trial, during a hardship. Jesus tells them, remember what I told you. Now, up to this point, Jesus has not told them fully about his death. In Matthew chapter 5, he alluded to it. In Matthew chapter 11, he alluded to it. But he has not fully told them, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. He has not explained this in its entirety. Now he's explaining it to, to them. And now there's some fear. Now there's some, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Jesus' counsel is this. Remember what I told you. Remember what I told you. Listen, friend, Satan has and always will be after servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read Revelation chapter 12, the great dragon, the symbolic of Satan. He's always been. You remember back in the Garden of Eden? You know what he did? He tried, them, tried to get them to forget what God had told them. Just eat the tree. God really didn't say that. God really didn't mean that. What's he doing in America today? 
Well, live any way you want, have fun, live in sin, do what you think is okay, because God is loving God and he doesn't really care. Friend, that is not God's words. Amen? That is not what God said. What are you and I to do when a problem comes? Stand up for truth. Remember what he said. Now, I want you to see Jesus is going to kind of look at his followers. Up to this point, do they really care what Jesus is going through? Honestly, think about it. Have they asked Jesus, what, what are you going to go through? Genuinely concerned what he was going to deal with? Have they done that? What were they concerned with? Jesus, when your kingdom comes, Jim's saying it right now, when your kingdom comes to this earth, who gets to sit by you? Who gets to have all the power? They were concerned about them. No one was concerned with what Jesus wanted. Look at verse 5 and 6 here. I want you to see, number one, Jesus is concerned about you. Jesus counsels you, and what is his counsel? Remember his words. Now I want you to see the lack of concern from his followers. Look at verse 5. But now... I go my way to him that sent me. Who was that? Who sent Jesus? God. So he's going back to God. And none of you askest me, asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. They were not concerned with what was going to happen with Jesus or Jesus' plan. They were concerned about them. Listen closely, friend. Who was going to die that next day? Jesus. Who was going to be beat that next day? Who was going to have a whip? would come and hit the back by highly trained Roman soldiers who knew how to inflict pain to the point where you were close to death, but you would not die. They would take that whip and they would whip their back and pieces of skin would come falling off. The book of Isaiah tells us that Jesus would be unrecognizable. Who was about to go through all that? Jesus, not the disciples. So could we use this word selfish? Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you asked Jesus his plan for you? When was the last time, instead of telling God to change your problem, you asked God to change your heart about the problem? Because genuinely, we as Christians, we like to say we care about the plan of God, but really speaking, we care about if God gives us enough money, gives us a bigger paycheck, gives us a better car, gives us a better house, and as long as he does those things, he's my God and he's my Savior and I'll sing songs to him and I'll go to church and I'll do this and I'll do that. When was the last time you truly were concerned about what Jesus thought? I'll be honest with you. I, was, I told my Sunday school class as I was studying Exodus, I told them something really popped out at me. But then I get to, I was just going to be verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to skip to the end of the chapter. But I read verse 5 and 6, and I saw the fact the disciples were not concerned what was going to happen to Jesus. And in my heart, God was speaking to me. Ben, when was the last time you were more concerned about what I thought than what you thought? Can I be honest with you? That kind of hit hard. Because you know what? I've got things going on in my life. You've got things going on in your life. And you know what I want? God, change it. God, make it better. God, these bills are killing me. God, take away the bills. You've got inflation. I mean, God, I can't pay $4 for eggs. What in the world? I mean, this is ridiculous. Instead of asking God, God, what's your plan in all this? What's your goal in all this? You know what Jesus prayed? You remember what Jesus prayed? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know what? Instead of us praying all the time that God would change the issues in our economy, have we ever asked Jesus if he was doing these things to prepare us for his coming kingdom? To prepare us to take us home? If these things have to happen for the end times, are we living in the end times? Do you see how this changes our mindset? Jesus, do you understand the lack of concern from his followers? When was the last time when you prayed, you asked for his will in your life, regardless of what that entailed? That's a scary prayer to pray. Because God's will for you might not be the way you want it. 
man, this really got a hold of me this week. Sometimes we cannot take our eyes off of ourselves and get them on him. Why were they not asking Jesus about the angels? Why did they not ask Jesus about the rewards in heaven? Why did they not ask Jesus, what is the coming kingdom going to be like? Why were they not concerned about the relationship with Jesus and the Father? Why? Because they were concerned with what was going to happen to them. And you know what? If I can be honest today, even Christian people, God's people, we're more concerned about us than we are about Friend, would you examine your heart and see the last time you prayed, did you ask for his will to be done in your life, regardless of what that entailed? Or did you ask God to change everything? I'm not against praying and asking God to change a situation, take away sickness. I'm for all of those things. But are you okay if God doesn't? The lack of concern from his followers. God, what is your will? But I want you to see, as we conclude this morning with this fact, it looks like my slide's down, with this fact, are you equipped for the problem? We only have a few more minutes, and I want you to see what Jesus does here. Look down at verse 13. Verse 13. You still with me this morning? Been a little bit, a little harder message here, but I want you to think about this. Verse 13. So what do I do? How can I make it? How can I be a better servant? How can I serve him? How can I remember his word? How can I do all these things? To be honest, you can't. But God can. Look here at verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. Who's the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. When he will come, he will what? Guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now jump down to verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into what? Oh, my goodness. The disciples are getting nervous. Jesus is saying, oh, there's all these bad things. The disciples are scared. They're, they have not sought the will of God. They're doing their thing. They're nervous. They're scared. Jesus says, look, I have to die. I have to go to heaven so the Holy Spirit will come down. And the Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit, if someone is truly Holy Spirit filled, they'll talk about Jesus. That's how you can tell a preacher who's filled with the Holy Spirit how they talk about Jesus. Okay? So I can tell if it's a good or bad preacher. If they're really Holy Spirit filled, they'll uplift and praise Jesus, right? Now, understand this the lack of concern from his followers. But lastly, this morning, I want you to write this down calm in the chaos. Calm in the chaos. What does the Holy Spirit do? So Jesus would ascend into heaven, the disciples would go out to where Jesus would ascend on hill they would watch Jesus go up and then the angels would come back and say hey fellas go back to Jerusalem wait for the Holy Spirit so about 120 are in this upper room they're waiting the Holy Spirit comes down it transforms and changes these individuals it takes them from being scared and shy and nervous to bold preachers of the gospel you understand today you're equipped to serve Christ if you're his child because the Holy Spirit has come inside of you. And he wants to guide you and lead you if you'll let him. Jesus continues to insist, I must go to the cross. The disciples have had enough. They're tired. They're wore out. They're nervous about what is going to take place. And Jesus says, I know what you're going through. And guess what? I'll not send you out there alone. I'll not send you out there unequipped. I will take care of everything that you need. So what does he do? At that moment, the Holy Spirit comes down. To this day, when you and I are born again into God's family, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And the Bible teaches us he seals us until the day of redemption. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful thought that you are equipped for service with the Holy Spirit? So now let me ask you this question. We'll be, we'll be through here. Are you following the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life? The Holy Spirit will never speak anything contrary to the word of God. So don't tell me you're following God and following the Holy Spirit when it's something contrary to the word of God. They all work together. God's word, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they 
all work together. They all work as one. They're not separate, right? They're not like, this is, God is speaking one thing, the Holy Spirit is speaking one thing, Jesus is speaking one thing. No, no, no. If somebody says the Holy Spirit came and told them to do something, and yet it was contrary to the Word of God, you can tell them it may have been a spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit, right? It was something out there. There's a lot of things speaking for your attention. There's a lot of things trying to get you to live the way you want. That's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. So today I ask you this. Are you following the leading of the Holy Spirit? Because if you are, you're equipped to do whatever. There's nothing you can't do. You say, Pastor, I've done some bad things in my life. Join the club. It's called sin, right? We've done bad things. The great thing about it is when we come to a point, we get to the end of ourselves, and we recognize our sin condemns us to an eternity in hell the lake of fire for all of eternity. When we get to that point and we realize we can't be good enough, we can't go to church enough, we can't say enough confessions, we can't do enough of these things, we humble ourselves. We recognize that Jesus is the only way. And we come before the throne of God and we bow our heads. Maybe we get on our knees and we say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm unworthy of heaven. I don't deserve it and I can't get there on my own. But I accept that Jesus died in my place. And I want him to be my savior, my guide. We come to that point and you can be his child. You could do that today. You could do that tomorrow. I wouldn't put it off very long. We never know when he'll return. I want you to understand this. The Holy Spirit exalts Jesus, energizes believers, rescues souls from hell, comforts, counsels, and empowers them. In verse 20, the Bible said the world rejoiced that Jesus died. To this day, the world rejoices when bad things happen. The world rejoices. Are you following the Holy Spirit? He cares about you today. Jesus cares about you. Are you more consumed with who you are and your plan and your agenda? Maybe today you need to humble yourself as I had to do this week. And maybe you can use an altar if you choose to. You can use your seat. And maybe you just need to say, Jesus, yeah, I've been praying for a lot of things, but they've been selfish. I can't remember the last time I asked you what your will, what your desire was. But today I'm going to do that. I don't want to be like the disciples who are more concerned about their place and what they would have happen. I want to be concerned about you. But also, would you ask God today, God, show me your will through your Holy Spirit and I'll follow. You are equipped to serve. You are equipped to serve the King of Kings because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he will guide you. Are you following him? Are you following? Do you care about what he has to say about your life? Oh, friend. Would you humble yourself before a holy God today? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this morning. The music is playing. I want to ask you this. Do you care what God has to say? Some are coming to the altar. If you want to, you feel free to. Maybe you need to pray and just ask Jesus to show you his will. What's his plan for your life? Some of you may be in this room and the Holy Spirit has spoke to you and you've fought him. You've told him it's my way. I know what I'm doing. Some have come. Will you do business with God right now? Throughout the auditorium, please don't look around. I want to ask you this question. If you're sitting here under the sound of my voice through Facebook or in this room, let me ask you a personal question. If you were to die today and stand before God, are you ready for eternity. If you're in here today and you'd say, Pastor Lang, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt there's a time and place in my life where I accepted Christ as my Savior and I became one of His followers. If you're here today and you know that to be true, praise the Lord. If you're here today, would you do me a favor? Maybe you'd say, Pastor Lang, I'll be honest. I don't know that I'm ready for eternity. I don't know. Would you just pray for me? All throughout the room, nobody look around, please. Very private time. But right now in your heart, you know you're not ready to stand before a holy God. If that's you today, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? I will not call you out. I will not ask you to do anything. That's between you and God. Pastor Lang, that's me. Would you just pray for me all around the room? I'm not sure where I would spend eternity. I'm not sure that I'm ready to meet my God. I don't know.
Are you following his leading? Are you living for him? Don't put it off. Don't put it off. We need followers of him. We need people in this church to forsake sin and stop playing with it. We need people to say God's will, he knows more than I do. Oh friend, get right with God today. Don't put it off. Serve him, live for him. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you're equipped. You can serve him, he's special. He's awful good to us. Gentlemen, you can pause that music. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you that you do care. Lord, I love that verse one. God, you want to warn them of what is coming. And God, we know as believers and followers of you that we will suffer some sort of persecution. The world mocks and the world laughs that we believe there is only one way to heaven, and that's through you, Jesus. I pray we as Christians would stand strong. God, I thank you that you warn us and you tell us about things that could happen and hardships that could come. And God, I pray during those times, I pray we would remember what you've said in your word. God, I pray that we would not be as your followers there at that time who were more concerned about them and their position and their lifestyle, what they thought, than they were about what you had to say. And lastly, God, I pray today that we would follow your Holy Spirit's leading Lord, if there's sin in someone's life right now, they would recognize that's not your will. They would turn from it, repent of it, get right with you, and see your blessings from a life that is serving you. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word. It's been powerful this morning. I pray each one of us would take these things to heart. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. If you would, please stand, look this way. Thank you so much for being with us today. We loved having you. And I hope you'll read chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 uh, throughout this week. And it's a wonderful portion of scripture. Some of my favorite in the whole Bible. Uh, And I hope you'll read all that. We could only get to very little of it today. But I hope you'll serve him today. Brother Brian, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? We will have choir tonight at 545. And uh, those who are going to be a part of the Secret Prayer Sisters, ladies, if you would come up as soon as Brian says amen, uh, Miss Barbara will be at the front to talk with you more about that. Brother Brian, would you dismiss us in prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we again thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us and given us. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the service today, Lord. Thank you for all those who've uh, come out. We thank you for the visitors, Father. And Lord, we just thank you so much for being so good to us and for meeting our needs. And Lord, I uh, just pray, uh, Father, that you just uh, guide us and direct us, Lord, and be with us as we go our separate ways. Protect us and bring us back the next 500 hour. Father, we love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.